What is knowledge? What is information? Why are they important? And why are they being restricted and targeted and manipulated? Why, hello there. You've caught me reading my large print copy of my favorite book, Looking for Alaska by John Green. Now, the thing about this book is that it's been banned in a lot of places, in libraries and in schools, because of a single scene that happened to be relatively sexual and it has cursing and stuff. It's about kids figuring, figuring out what life is and figuring out what they want to do with their lives. And it's about grief and love and the importance of emotional connection over lustful sexual encounters. And it's my favorite book of all time. And it's very important. And people can't read it. There are people that can't read it. There are people that, there are kids that if they wanted to read it, they wouldn't be able to. And I think that's kind of messed up. The most dangerous thing a government can do is limit the knowledge its citizens have access to. Whether it's under the guise of protecting the children or containing sensitive information or treating knowledge like the weapon it is. Because it is a weapon, not in the same way a gun or a sword is, but in the same way a rock or a stick on the ground or your fists are. All of these weapons are plentiful and available to the general public. Why limit the power of words and not the power of these simple objects that are dangerous when wielded by someone with sufficient resolve? Maybe it's because everyone has their own rocks and sticks and fists, but when everyone has one person's words, that's when they become dangerous. Organization is the medium that makes words dangerous. But see, that's just the thing. Because they should be dangerous. They should be maintained as dangerous. We should all be existing on the tightrope of enough people knowing enough things to make enough change. What things and what change and what people will always be the subject of debate. But the debate should never be on their ability to know those things or talk to those people or make that change. That should never be questioned. Assuming the change and their methods of making that change don't cause any unjust harm. Today, we are surrounded by misinformation and apathy and unjust harm. From the culture war on trans people, to the apathy towards children being killed in schools, to politicians feeling no responsibility for what their actions or inactions do to the people they swore to serve. Nazi Germany is a prime example of controlling knowledge and creating a harmful narrative around minorities. If you control the public's understanding of an issue, you control their support of your actions in that issue. I don't think I have to elaborate further. I know you might think that an angsty book about being a kid finding out what love is doesn't apply to this, but it does. The moment it's made harder to find information is the moment you're no longer free. The government has a responsibility to keep our children alive not safe from drag shows. The, o the only danger associated with drag is our politicians dragging their feet. But nothing will ever get done. Because like I said, they feel no responsibility and apathy is becoming an unprecedented epidemic. And now they want to ban TikTok, eradicate the platform for 150 million Americans free speech with no evidence that it's owned by China. In fact, all the evidence to the contrary. But we all know the truth. This isn't a byproduct of any facts or any politician's original thought. We're not facing this threat because of any real threat to the, to the country. It's because some corporations are afraid of TikTok and are lobbying the US government to remove their competition, citing the same wrongdoings that they regularly do themselves, selling our information to the highest bidder with no discrepancy as to the implications or to whom they're selling it to. China knows more about you because of Facebook than because of TikTok. All the greedy, morally depraved things you attribute to China are not a Chinese thing, they're a late-stage capitalism thing. 
I'm not saying I'm a communist, I'm not saying I'm a socialist, but there has to be a middle ground between the fascism we're crawling towards today and the communism we've been running from for the better part of a century. It gets hard for me not to feel hopeless and nihilistic toward the whole world. Like there's nothing that can save us, like we're coming close to the end of everything. But maybe that's just because all of those horrible, morally depraved things that always happen are just harder to ignore now. No wonder we have a mental health problem in this country. Everything feels hopeless, because given the right attention, anyone would, at any time in history. If the ancient Greeks, or Romans, or whoever had iPhones, they'd probably feel hopeless too. But then why don't we suck it up, carry ourselves by our bootstraps, and just continue on in our lives? Suffer for the sake of suffering. Isn't that what being a human is all about? Well, maybe not. I hope not. If you so choose, you can look up wholesome memes on YouTube, or you could look into all the gory information regarding our most recent mass shooting. That's up to you. But I think that's where the disconnect lies with our feeling of hopelessness, because it's manufactured. Like I said, by the fact that it's so easy to access and get trapped in. So you have these two worlds in front of you, the one made up of wholesome memes and kindness and empathy, and then the one made up of mass shootings and apathy and transgenocide. Wouldn't you opt to choose the former? And thus, would you not try to make that world a reality and feel a deep disappointment when it doesn't happen, when you find out that the world is much more often filled with the latter? It's with the feeling that you can make change, and then having that feeling ripped from you, that suffering becomes all the more unbearable. And that's when people end their lives. That's when people die, as a symptom of a world that refuses to let the dreamers dream hard enough. So, what do we do? I have no fucking clue. But maybe that's a good thing. A blank canvas has the most potential it will ever have. Once your first splash of paint arrives, it snuffs out quintillions of possibilities. But yet, that potential is what cripples you. The infinite possibilities paralyze, and at the end of the day, you end up with a still blank canvas. I find that I get my best ideas from talking to my friends. I'll be complaining about writer's block, or how a video didn't do well, etc. And then it'll hit me. Do this, or that. Write a video about death, or video games, or space time. But I think we all get our best ideas from corroborating, allowing ourselves to be the lumbering mass of minds and communication and infrastructure we are. But we can't do that if there's no way to communicate those things. I've never known a painter who painted his masterpiece while the government was watching. I have not made a single one of my videos because someone told me to, and I never will. One of my favorite things about Looking for Alaska is that the kids ask themselves and each other questions about life, what they think about what it is to be alive, and they just find ways to have fun together, pulling pranks, smoking, drinking, what have you. The stupid shit kids do because they don't know any better because they think they're invincible. Because, as Miles Pudge Halter wrote in his essay at the end of the book, when adults say teenagers think they are invincible with that sly, stupid smile on their faces, they don't know how right they are. We never need be hopeless because we can never be irreparably broken. We think that we are invincible because we are. We cannot be born and we cannot die like all energy, we can only change shapes and sizes and manifestations. They forget that when they get old. They get scared of losing and failing. But that part of us greater than the sum of our parts cannot begin and cannot end, and so it cannot fail. And I believe this to be true to the highest degree. When you have something bigger than yourself, this sense of belonging and minuscule yet measurable importance, you are invincible because you become more than just a bag of flesh and bones, and even more than a name and a face on a screen, a voice from a speaker, you become the idea of you. That is what banning TikTok will destroy. The previously thought indestructible sense of urgency and idealization and thought and words and impact. 
the impact people have on each other despite being on a complete other sides of the country, destroyed just because when people come together and they feel empathy and see struggle and feel the power you wield with the minuscule yet measurable importance you have, people tend to do good things, which happens to be very bad for bad people. I know I very well might be wrong about TikTok, and I know that I don't know everything. Maybe I'm in too deep and I'm starting to believe the wrong people. But when you care enough about something, and feel enough hope when before you felt none, you'll believe anything. I believe that TikTok is a very good thing to a lot of people. It makes so many people feel less alone. It gives so many people hope. It gives a voice to the voiceless and I don't want anyone to lose their voice. I send my girlfriend dumb lovey-dovey TikToks all the time. She sends them to me too. I have a friend who I send exclusively TikToks in a series called Bigger Than Goose, where Goose's owners compare him to household objects because he's a kitten and he's small and he's cute. I get a large amount of my news from creators on TikTok, a few of whom have visited the White House and appear to be largely regarded as official the same way any other news anchor or what have you would be. My point is that TikTok means a lot to a lot of people. Banning TikTok, passing the Restrict Act, is a clear violation of Americans' First Amendment rights. Make sure your representatives and local government officials know how you feel about this, and make sure they know they don't have your vote if they help pass the Restrict Act. I want to thank everyone that creates quality, wholesome, and or informative content on TikTok. It seriously makes my life measurably better. And thank you all for watching.